Good morning, everybody. This is Leslie Pergossum with Vesta Property Services. Uh, we are just a minute or so away from starting our board certification webinar with Aaron Silverman of Silverman Law. Uh, we're going to give it a few more minutes to let some people, uh, some more people join our webinar, but I just wanted to say uh, good morning and welcome. We'll be starting soon. Good morning, everybody. This is Leslie Pergossum with Vesta Property Services. We're gonna go ahead and start this morning's webinar um, on board certification. Uh, we've got Aaron Silverman with Silverman Law. And just um, for planning purposes, uh, this presentation will take approximately two hours this morning. Uh, so we will go ahead and start and we'll start with some housekeeping tips um, everybody is going to be muted. Uh, your video will be turned off. At the end of today's presentation, all the participants will receive a copy of the presentation and a certificate of completion via email. Uh, you should uh, plan to receive that by end of day tomorrow. Um, we'll be answering questions at the end of today's webinar, time permitting. If you could please submit your questions in the Q&A button located on the toolbar, that would be great. And like I said, uh, we will be answering those questions at the end of this morning's webinar. So we're gonna go ahead and start. Um, again, this is a board certification course. It is presented by Aaron Silverman, Esquire with Silverman Law. Today we have Neil Wayne, who is a CAM of Vesta's West Central Florida. He's a, an operations manager for Vesta Property Services. Neil started with Vesta in May of 2019. He's got more than seven years of experience as a CAM and more than 16 years of corporate security industry experience. We also have Aaron Silverman Esquire, who will be presenting today's webinar. He is a board certified condominium and planned development attorney. He opened Silverman Law nine years ago to focus on community association. And he's been practicing law for over 15 years. And as you can see here, he was awarded an AV preeminent rating by Martin Dale Hubble. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. Thank you so much for the introduction. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, Neil. Um, just one additional matter for housekeeping purposes. Um, after this presentation, um, because this is a board certification course, um, you will be receiving a certificate uh, from Vesta that will have a blank where you can put your name on it. It will be important that you complete that and then turn it into your property manager or whomever maintains your association's official records. Um, as that certificate will be required to be on, on, on file as part of the association's official records. Um, so go ahead and move on. Um, as, as Leslie said, this is what our firm does. We handle all different types of uh, matters for our community association clients, work with about 120, 130 uh, community associations across the, the, the Tampa Bay area. Um, next slide. 
And of course, it would not be a presentation from a lawyer without a nice big disclaimer in the in the front that this is not legal advice. Um, everyone on uh, on this call should have um, your your community association lawyer. If you don't, it would be advisable to have a community association lawyer. But a lot of this is the thirty thousand foot view information from the statutes. As we'll discuss during the presentation, a lot of your governing documents are going to um, impact the overall analysis. All right, next slide. So a lot of you have recently been elected and that is um, why you are um, attending this meeting. Um, and hopefully after the end of this presentation, this isn't how you're going to, to feel um, going into your board and member meeting that your, your, your resolution is simply going to be to lay low um, until the next annual meeting when someone else will take over. Uh, go ahead. So what governs the association? Um, I, it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not Moses with, with two tablets written in stone. They're, they're living and breathing documents, but there's a lot of different things that, that govern what control your community. Um, next slide. And these are all the different things that control. You have the Florida Constitution and Florida statutes. Everyone's familiar with 718 and 720 that govern condos versus HOAs. Um, you have your governing documents, the associations, declaration, the bylaws, the articles, the rules. You also have administrative regulations. For instance, if you're within a condominium, there are detailed election procedures set forth in Florida administrative code. Federal law also controls uh, within your community. If you're in an HOA um, and you have uh, restrictions on satellite dishes, you may not be able to uh, enforce those as you think you might be able to enforce them because of the, uh, the federal law that's applicable. And for all communities, the Fair Housing Act is, is going to apply. Um, and I know a lot of associations end up dealing with that in connection with the, the big hot topic today uh, of, of assistance animals. Um, and finally, local law, ordinances and codes, whether it's a barking ordinance that, that Hillsborough County has, or it is noise ordinances um, and other types of, of, of local, local code govern your community. Um, it's important to look at this holistically and what controls um, over each other. Um, and that's something that uh, a great property manager um, and uh, association lawyer can help uh, guide you in, in connection with that. Um, next slide. So association powers and duties. This is the language from chapter 718 or 720. Um, this is not what's contained within your restrictions. You should look in your bylaws, the declaration articles to see additional powers and duties that may be there. But essentially you have all the rights, powers and privileges granted to uh, the association by the governing documents, the law governing corporations, which is 617 or 607. Um, and, and other applicable law. Um, you can enter into contracts, you can sue, yes, you can be sued um, with respect to how you handle things within your community. Um, you can settle or appeal actions on behalf of the unit owners if it concerns matters of common interest. You have the power to make and collect assessments. You have the duty to maintain common elements. Next slide. Um, you have the power to acquire title, to real and personal property, um, to purchase land or recreational leases upon approval of the voting interest as required by the declaration. Um, unless there's a limitation in the documents, you have the power to purchase units um, in the condominium um, or in the HOA to purchase uh, lots, homes, um, and to acquire, hold, lease, mortgage, and convey them. You have the, the power to purchase units at a foreclosure sale for unpaid assessments or to take a uh, title in lieu of foreclosure. And there, there's, um, before we go to the next slide, there, there's issues that frequently arise um, and you really need to uh, consult your, your documents. And this is something that having a great property manager like, like Neil um, on, on, uh, on deck to ask the questions and know when you need to escalate it to council. But the things that I'm thinking of are items like loans. Sometimes you find it buried in your articles of incorporation that yes, you can take out a loan, 
provided you have two thirds approval of all owners. Well, that's something you want to think of before uh, you as a board member signs a, um, a certification that you have the authority to enter into a loan with a financial institution. Special assessments as well. Some documents have a requirement that if there's a special assessment over a certain amount that you have to get approval of the membership. Those are things to look into and consult with uh, management and council about. Um, and those are just two examples, but there are a lot of examples of what may um, require a, a unit owner vote prior to engaging in, in, in certain actions. Okay, we can move on. So the board's business judgment. This provides that board members um, can exercise their reasonable business judgment in connection with decisions and the boards are generally, the decisions of the board are generally protected by this rule. A, essentially, a court is not going to step in and say, you should have hired this landscaper instead of that landscaper. As long as your decision was reasonable um, in connection with the, the whole process and you had the power to make that decision, a court is not gonna substitute its judgment for that of the board. Now, if you are taking out a loan and the owners have to approve it, that's not gonna be entitled to deference. But if you have the power to do something as, as the association's board and it's proper for you to take that action, making one decision versus uh, a, a, another one, the court is general, generally not going to substitute its judgment for that of the boards. Next, uh, next slide. And this is where having a great team in place is really important because the board can rely in good faith on opinions, reports, financial statements, and other information provided by your attorney, accountants, property managers, engineers. Um, if you rely in good faith on the opinion of your engineer, then the board can say, we relied in good faith. The business judgment rule should protect us from action from an owner trying to claim we did something improperly. But it has to be reasonable and it has to be in good faith. Okay, next slide. As a board member, you have a fiduciary relationship to all of your owners. You are responsible for helping to manage what for many people is the single most valuable um, investment they have, their home. So you need to exercise caution and act in the, uh, in the best interest of all people within your community. And that's where that fiduciary relationship uh, comes about. Next slide. Conflicts of interest. Um, it's different for condos and HOAs, um, but the conflict of interest within a condo is more complicated because the legislature um, created an irreconcilable conflict of interest or, or an irreconcilable conflict in the language within the conflict of interest provisions. Essentially, one section states that you cannot contract with a company where a board member has a financial interest, period, or somebody related to a board member has a financial interest. In another section, it says, you can do so as long as you disclose it properly. So for condos, our advice with our clients is if you wanna enter into a contract with a roofing company, that uh, the board member owns or the board member's uh, brother, mother, father, sister own, the board member should resign from the board and then you can move forward with that contract. But that's the safest and most conservative approach. For HOAs, on the next slide, HOAs require um, a certain disclosure that you can enter into a contract with a company where a board members financially interested, but the board has to follow certain procedures that are set forth in chapter 617, which is the statute governing not-for-profit corporations, where you have to make a fair and reasonable, uh, and the contract has to be fair and reasonable. You have to disclose it. Two thirds of the disinterested directors have to approve it. And at the next members meeting, whether it's a month from now or a year from now, a majority of the members can vote to terminate the contract without penalty for early cancellation. Next slide. Board member compensation. Uh, 
usually if we were in person, I would ask everyone to raise their hand uh, to show me whether they earn six figures um, by serving on their board. I'm assuming everyone at home has their hand down. Um, if you have your hand up, you'd be in, in, in big trouble. It's a volunteer position. No compensation is permitted. You can accept goods or services. Uh, you cannot solicit goods or services. So you, you can't accept a ticket to go and sit in one of your vendors' skyboxes at the Bucks game next year because you're on the board. That's not appropriate. You can go when we can reconvene in person. Um, you can accept food at an educational event or pens or notepads or uh, little, uh, you know, stress ball shape like uh, like homes at, at, at these kind of events. All that stuff is okay. Um, but you cannot accept um, anything valued at $25 or more. If you violate it, the penalty is immediate removal from office by the other board members. Um, this is something I've never seen happen, um, but it, it is possible and that's what the law provides. Next slide. So the statute um, uh, was amended a few years ago and provides a lot of additional um, uh, punitive measures in there for board members behaving badly. And this is not just um, this is not just not sending out notice as they should, but this is um, stealing money, falsifying votes, forging votes, things along those lines. But if you're a board member and you're charged, not convicted, but you're charged with theft or embezzlement of association money or property, you're removed from office. You don't have to be convicted. It's just simply being charged. At that point, the board fills your spot, just like they would on any other vacancy, and you're off the board until the charges are dropped um, or dismissed. So in Florida, association boards, you are guilty until proven innocent. Next slide. Uh, common elements versus common areas. So for this slide, we're looking at condos on the left and HOAs on the right. Common elements, this is the language within the statute. Your governing documents in a condo is going to have a lot more additional information. Plus, you're going to have the plat drawings, the, the maps where it shows the unit boundaries and it has really small print that you have to take a magnifying glass to read. Um, to show what all is common elements, limited common elements, et cetera. Um, that's all what would be considered a common element. And in a condo, it's generally everything from the, the surface of the drywall out is going to be considered a common element with certain, um, with, with certain exceptions. In an HOA, common areas are anywhere that's not on a lot. So, when you look at your plat map for your homeowners association, you'll see the, how the lot is drawn and you'll see what looks like a road snaking through. That doesn't mean the road is the common area and everything beyond the road, including the strip of grass and the sidewalk is all on the lot. You have to look at the measurements because if it's showing the road is 60 feet wide, you need to measure from the center line of the road, 30 feet in each direction and see where the actual common area stops. A lot of times it is sidewalk. Um, the sidewalk in that strip of grass is all considered common area. But you need to make sure you know not only where the common area is, but who has the maintenance obligations associated with the common areas. Okay, Good. next slide. Common elements or, uh, or common areas. Um, you the document, you have to look to the documents. Um, you need to see what the documents say in order to determine whether something is common element versus unit, common area versus lot. Next slide. Material alterations is, 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 a, is a hot topic uh, with a lot of associations with common elements for condos and common areas uh, for HOAs. Neil, Neil, what's the weirdest request um, you've seen from, uh, from a board for a material alteration to the common areas? Have you, had, have you seen anything interesting? Um, nothing out of the ordinary other than, you know, something for general use, like uh, additional barbecue or something like that. Nothing, just nothing that's just. So, so no, no people, no people swinging from the balcony here. No, definitely not. No, that would not be allowed. <laughs> so in, in this picture, it would, it, it's clearly a material alteration to the common elements in your high rise condo. Um, 
For condos, the statute requires a 75% vote of all owners, unless the governing documents provide otherwise. And a material alteration, it's not just something as absurd as installing swings on, on the common elements, but arbitration uh, cases um, and arbitrators have, have found that changing the color of pool furniture cushions are considered a material alteration requiring a unit owner vote. So it's a very low threshold to requiring a unit owner vote. Um, it's important to take this vote before you actually engage in the, in, in the alteration. Statute was amended a few years ago to say that the vote has to take place before you do it. You can't ask for forgiveness afterwards. Now, that's not to say that sometimes that becomes necessary. Uh, I haven't seen that litigated yet because it's a, a new statute as to what you have to do, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a war story example as to what can happen if you don't get that vote beforehand. And this was a, a case in, in court where a condo building, they repainted the building a completely different color. Some of the owners didn't like it. They said you did not get the vote ahead of time. And the, um, the court said, you have two options. Even though you've paid a few hundred thousand dollars to paint this building a new color, you can either get the 75% vote now or you can repaint it back. So of course they got the vote at that point because people did not want to be specially assessed to repaint the building after it had just been painted. But that stresses the importance of getting the vote first. For HOAs, it's going to be very, very different. You need to look to the language of the governing documents for any limitations because the statute does not have um, a limitation on material alterations for HOAs. You just can't change the scheme of development um, within an HOA. You can't substantially change a common area um, in a manner that would not permit it to be usable by members, um, such as installing uh, a storage facility um, that's lockable and only usable by property management um, over the tennis courts previously um, usable by all. That kind of thing within an HOA will not be permitted without um, some agreement or assent by the, by the members. And it depends on your documents. Next page. Board meetings. Any meeting of a quorum of the board during which association business is discussed. Neil, have you ever heard of association workshops? All the time, yeah. And uh, do you think you can use an association workshop to get around the meeting notice of, of a board? No, not as long as there is a quorum and you are discussing business. So it is a, it is a board meeting. Yeah, absolutely right. You, you, you cannot, um, and we can go on to the next slide, you cannot say that something's a board workshop it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a board get together, it's a board dinner. If you have a quorum of the board together where you are going to discuss association business, it is a board meeting that requires notice. Now, a lot of people ask the question about emails. Um, emails amongst board members where they're going to discuss business um, is, is okay. The statute was amended a few years ago that board members can discuss items via email, but you cannot vote and approve items via email. Of course, there are exceptions in cases of an emergency within the statute. And if that does happen, then you can, um, you can ratify that decision at the next board meeting. But that should not be the, uh, the default um, practice uh, amongst your association because members are not going to like showing up to your meeting and the board is just rubber stamping decisions they've already made. People want to see how the sausage is made. The people who show up to your meeting, they wanna see the board discussing an item. Um, so things are done in the sunshine. Next uh, slide. Well, how are board meetings noticed? It, it's not very difficult to notice a board meeting. Now, the four words at the beginning here are really important, unless documents provide otherwise. This is the language from the statute. So if your governing documents require five days, three days, seven days for board meetings, you have to comply with that provision in your, in your documents. If they're silent, then it's 48 hours notice. They have to be posted um, in, the, in the community. 
in an HOA or condo, and you have to provide notice to the, to, to the board members um, in advance as well. It's really important that you provide this notice. You can have a proper meeting. Uh, if you're going to have a budget meeting where you're going to vote on a special assessment or other assessments or changes to rules regarding unit or lot use, you have to mail, deliver, or send electronically if you if you uh, have adopted a electronic uh, notice uh, resolutions um, and um, post it at least 14 days in advance. So for those meetings where, it, yes, it is a board meeting, it's not a membership meeting, but for certain board meetings, you do have to um, uh, send notice at least 14 days in advance. Budget meetings, a lot of times, your documents say 30 days in advance. I've seen some that say 60 days in advance. So it's really important to pick up the phone and call Neil and ask him, are we sure we need to provide just 14 days or can we provide 30, do, what do our documents say? Um, so that way you can properly adopt your budget because unless you have a properly adopted budget, you won't have a properly adopted assessment. Okay, next slide. Now that you're at your board meeting, this is how voting takes place. You have a duty to vote or abstain due to a conflict of interest. Um, if you don't vote, you're presumed as assenting to the action taken. You can't sit there quietly. Um, if you abstain from voting, um, it's presumed to have taken no position regarding the matter. Um, the minutes are to show a vote or abstention for each member and directors may not vote by proxy or secret ballot at board meetings, except that officers may be elected by secret ballot. Okay, next slide. Okay, member participation in board meetings. Yes, all members have a right to participate in board, mem uh, in board meetings. Um, that doesn't mean that they can stand up and interrupt your board meeting, um, but they can speak subject to reasonable restrictions. The board can adopt rules uh, regarding the manner of owner participation. Um, Florida Administrative Code um, does include a whole section that deals with the videotaping and recording of board meetings um, that are that is permissible, that owners can um, videotape or record meetings. Um, they can't you know, do the Steven Spielberg multiple camera angle uh, you know, directing um, through the board meetings, but the board can require um, folks to provide notice before they're gonna show up with a camera and record the board meeting. Next slide. Unit owner meetings. Uh, owners are required to have an annual meeting. Um, you can have it at the location set forth in your bylaws. If there's no location, it needs to be held within 45 miles of the association. Don't be one of those associations that schedules their, 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 um, their annual meeting 44.5 miles from the uh, location of, of your community because you want to discourage owner participation and attendance. Um, you won't be on the board long if you do things like that. Um, it's just kind of a dirty pool. Um, but the purpose of the annual meeting is to conduct an election um, and any other business of the association. Um, you can have as many membership meetings as you want during the course of, of the year. You just have to provide proper notice, which is on the next slide. Just like the notice we talked about for certain types of board meetings where more notice is required, you must provide at least 14 days notice for membership meetings on the property and uh, by mailing or delivering the notice to the membership. Um, many documents do require more notice, so you need to make sure you know what your documents say, um, but that's the notice for unit owner meetings. Okay, quorum requirement. Next, next slide. So for quorum, and I know that there were some, uh, some questions that have been asked, and, and Neil, as we go through, if you see questions that, that pop up, um, if you want to, you know, bring them to my attention as we're, as we're going through it, so that way we can make sure we, we're, we're, uh, knocking them out as, as we go through. But um, for quorum requirement, if you're in an HOA and your documents say 50% to have a quorum, meaning the, the principal mass of owners to actually con convene a meeting, it's not 30%. I mean, it's not 50%, it's 30. Because the statute says 30% for a quorum unless 
a lower number exists in the documents. For condos, it's 50% unless a lower number exists in the governing documents. Now, I know that there were some things we talked about before with material alterations and 75% vote of owners. For the material alterations, for example, it's 75% of all owners by statute. Your documents can change that and reduce the number. But if your documents say 75% or two thirds of all voting interests or all owners, it doesn't matter what the quorum requirement is. It matters how many total people voted in favor of something. If your documents say 75% of those people that participate in person or by proxy, then you're looking at 75% of a quorum. And this is something that Neil or your, or your council can help guide you through as you're trying to determine what you actually need to get things accomplished during a meeting. Hey, Aaron. Yes, sir. That does exclude the delinquent owners beyond 90 days, right? Yes, yes, and, and but you have to actually suspend their rights to vote. And we'll talk about that later in the presentation. So it's a good point. Um, if you have owners that are delinquent, you can suspend their right to vote. And it will actually, if you have 10 owners delinquent, you have 100 units, you would reduce the number of total units from 100 to 90 um, until they bring their account current. And then it would be 50% of 90, not 50% of 100 to actually have a, uh, a, a quorum. Um, but you have to have a board meeting where you suspend their rights to vote. So that needs to be a, a, an agenda item where you're doing that. Okay, next slide. So bids, um, they're very similar between condominium and HOA, how you need to handle them. Of course, this is what the statute says, governing documents, uh, do have other language, um, but the, the fundamental difference is the threshold. For condos, you have to com obtain competitive bids for contracts, services, items that will exceed 5% of the budget, including reserves. For HOAs, it's 10% of the budget, including reserves. Now, this does not apply to employees of the association, property manager, attorneys, accountants, architects, or landscape architects, not landscapers, but landscape architects. You don't have to accept the lowest bid um, as, as part of this, as part of your business judgment. And as far as how many bids you need to be competitive, do you have to have three? No, do you have to have two? Probably, most likely two or more um, would be the definition of something that would be competitive. But if you have a situation where you have been trying to get bids for job, uh, for work to be performed. And despite all of your efforts, you've only gotten a bid from one company or there's only one provider within your county um, and other, uh, and other, uh, and other factors, then you could potentially um, uh, just go with one bid. Neil, have you had that happen uh, this year, especially during, uh, during COVID? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah. So if it, it's not common, for you not to be able to get more than one bid. Um, but if you're going to go with only a single bid and competitive bidding would have been required, you should definitely run it up the flagpole <clears throat> to property management or, or council to make sure that you've done everything you you can do and, uh, and document your, your efforts to get those competitive bids. All right, next slide. Budgets and reserves within an HOA. So in an HOA, you're required to prepare an annual budget and provide each member a copy of the budget or inform them that a copy is available upon request. It may, I use the word may and stress it, include reserves for capital expenditures or deferred maintenance. Next slide. And, and this is when it includes reserves. If the developer initially established reserves or if the members, the members voted to provide for reserves, then you're required to maintain and fund reserve accounts. So if they were not, if your initial turnover budget from the developer didn't include anything for reserves and your members never voted to implement mandatory reserves, then you can't have mandatory reserve accounts. You can 
still have voluntary deferred maintenance account, but it's not going to be mandatory reserves. If you do have mandatory reserves, it's going to be um, the amount's going to be determined based on an, a, a formula using the estimated remaining useful life and replacement cost um, of, of an item. So if you have a clubhouse and it has a roof, it's going to cost $10,000 to fix and it has 10 years left on its life, then you should be putting in $1,000 a year every year until the 10th year when you're going to replace the roof. That's a very simplified way of looking at reserves. Yes, there are other options with pooling reserves and everything else, um, but we're not going to get into uh, those, those details today. If members want to fund less reserves than required or want to use reserves, mandatory reserves for another purpose, then a majority of the voting interest present in person or by proxy, that means a majority of a quorum or majority of the people there may vote to waive or reduce the funding of reserves for that year only. Next slide. For condos, it's much more detailed um, for a wide variety of reasons, including the fact that there's so much that the condo association is responsible for maintaining typically. Um, and there is a whole section of Florida administrative code that details reserves and rules concerning reserves. Um, for your for a condo, the budget um, must be detailed, has to show the amount budgeted by accounts and expenses. Um, in addition to annual operating, you must include reserves. Um, the reserve accounts must include, and this is what uh, it calls for by statute, the reserves for roof replacement, building painting, pavement resurfacing, um, and any other item that exceeds $10,000. So if you're in a high rise condo, you're gonna be reserving for, um, for pumps, for pool, um, for elevators, um, for a wide variety of things um, that the association is responsible for. And in order to do that, you have to, generally speaking, um, the, the, the preferred method would be to retain the services of an engineer to prepare a reserve study. They will come out, they'll inspect your building, they'll take a look at everything, the condition of it, how much they are estimating um, is left on the life of it. And they will tell you based on our calculations, this is how much you should be funding each year to make sure that your reserves are, are fully funded. Um, next slide. Um, and I, I know we talked briefly, uh, I, I'm just hinted at pooling. Um, if, you're, if you're doing pooling reserves, the reserve study you're gonna have prepared um, is going to be done by an engineer and they're going to calculate it out um, 20, 30 years to show you based on our calculations, this is the amount that you need to reserve for each year because all of your reserves are gonna be in one account. But in order for you to be able to pay for things as they come due, um, you're going to maybe um, in one year, you're going to pay a higher amount in for this portion of the building because it's coming up for replacement. But something that you're, you're, is not going to be subject to replacement for a long time, maybe it'll be a smaller portion. But that is something, a detailed calculation that your, uh, your engineer will put together for you. Um, the same thing as in an HOA and a condo, if you want to not fully fund your reserves, you need to um, have a majority of the voting interest present, not a majority of all, but those present, uh, vote to waive or reduce the funding of reserves. If you do not fully fund, you must have this vote every year to reduce the full funding of reserves. Um, if you want to use what you have, if you don't have a pooled reserve account, and you have line item reserves, then whatever you have, if you wanna use painting for paving, you have to have a vote for the owners to authorize the movement of those funds from the painting line item to the paving line item. Next slide. So financial reporting. Um, this is set forth by, uh, by 718 and 720. Um, within 90 days after the end of the fiscal year, or on whatever date is set forth in your bylaws, you have to prepare a financial report. Um, on completion, you have to provide it to the members or um, inform them that the report is available upon request. Um, 
regardless, members are entitled to the financial report not later than 120 days after the end of the fiscal year. Next slide. The level of reporting that you need to provide is based on your revenues. And it's a sliding scale based on the amount of revenue that you have, not your net income, but your revenue. So if you have total annual revenues of less than $150,000, you just have to prepare a report of cash receipts and receipts and expenditures. If you have 150 to 300,000, you have to prepare compiled financial statements between three to 500,000 reviewed financial statements. And if you have revenues over 500,000, you have to have your financial statements audited each year. <clears throat> this is not a forensic audit. It's an audit prepared by an accounting firm, but it does need to be audited. Next uh, slide. If you're in a condo, um, uh, a majority of the total voting interests present may vote to have a lower version of financial statements prepared unless the governing documents require a certain type of report. So if you have over 500,000 <clears> and you have deemed it's not cost effective to have an annual audit prepared, then you can vote and you need to do it before the fiscal year expires, but you can vote to have a uh, reviewed financial statements or compiled financial statements prepared. For HOAs, um, if you wanna have a higher version, if you only have $150,000, <coughs> excuse me, in revenues, and you're in an HOA, a majority of all members have to vote to have a higher version. So if you want to do an audit every year in an HOA and you have a $150,000 budget uh, or $150,000 in revenues, then a majority of all owners need to approve it. In condos, it's a board decision. If you're on a condo board and you want to do annual audits and you don't have that half a million dollar um, revenue threshold, then you can do it based on the board deciding to do it. Next slide, please. Sure, before we move on, Aaron, we've got a question regarding financial reports and if they should include uh, delinquent accounts. Well, the financial reports are going to be um, those prepared by your accountant that are, that are um, talking about um, whether it's compiled financial statements, they may not include, here's the list of delinquencies. Um, that's a question that you can talk to your accountant as to far as whether you need to provide those. This is the end of the year report. You're going to show bad debt or your delinquent um, dues as an item in your report, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the delinquent, the delinquency list is part of that. But the delinquency list um, is available to to members to be able to, to review. If a member makes um, an official records inspection request, which we'll talk about, um, they want to see um, all of the financial information. They can review bank accounts, bank account statements, um, delinquency lists, all of that is part of the, the official records. Okay, amending the governing documents. Um, for a condominium and an HOA, Almost every one of my clients has specific provisions within all three of their documents, the articles, bylaws, and declaration. But for the rare association that doesn't, the statute defaults to two-thirds of voting interest, which means two-thirds of all owners. Um, but this is something that's going to be very document-specific. Um, if you're in a condo, there are certain limitations on ability to amend uh, documents in a way that would affect certain leasing rights, such as ability to lease and a reduced um, term for leases. Okay, next slide. Amendments, um, in order to adopt amendments, they must be proposed first by the board or may be proposed by the owners if the governing documents have a procedure for that and then need to be submitted to the owners in advance of the meeting to vote on them. Um, that is the 14 days in advance for the membership meeting. Um, the amendments show underlines and strike throughs or contain certain language regarding substantial change to uh, language in the provision. And then once they're approved by the membership, the certificate of amendment needs to be prepared and executed with the formalities of a deed, meaning 
needs to be notarized in the presence of two witnesses. And the amendment is not going to be effective until recorded. So just because you've adopted an amendment, you need to actually make sure the clerk of the court in your county um, has recorded it before it will be deemed effective. Next slide. Assessments is a really long four letter word. Um, it, for condos, the definition in the statute means a share of the funds which are required for the payment of common expenses, which from time to time is excess against the, uh, the unit owner. You should also look to the definition of assessments in your declaration and may have some additional language. HOA, it's a broader term, it means a sum or sums of money payable to the association. It's just sums payable to the association. So some HOAs have specific assessments against owners that can uh, be lienable. Um, but if you're in a condo, the only amounts that are lienable would be assessments for common expenses. Next slide. Then you have special assessments. Special assessments is anything that's levied against a unit uh, other than the assessment required by a budget annually. You need to check the documents to make sure that there are no certain limitations um, in, the, uh, in the documents that would prohibit or restrict your uh, implementation of a special assessment. Next slide. Notice of special assessment, just like a board meeting, um, uh, just like an owner's meeting rather, and like the other board meetings we talked about, the longer notice, 14 days prior to the board meeting during which the special assessment is gonna be considered. It has to be mailed to all the owners. So that way people know that there's gonna be a special assessment that's coming due. Um, if the special assessment requires ownership approval, then you need to have a members meeting to approve the special assessment. But you can't just say special assessment on the notice, consideration of special assessment. You have to, identify the specific purpose or purposes of a special assessment. And we recommend that our clients include um, not just the purpose for purposes, but the estimated amount for the assessment in the notice as well. Because if you're gonna tell your, your, your owners, we're gonna assess you $5,000 payable immediately, you want people to have as much notice as possible to plan. Um, you don't have to stick to the number in the notice, as long as you provide information that says this is a uh, proposed amounts, but it's subject to change during the meeting. Because when the board gets there and is discussing the bids that you've received, you'll then be in a position where you can actually have the final numbers to adopt the final amounts owed. Next slide. Collecting assessments. Um, chapter 718 and 720 provide uh, condos and HOAs with the ability to take action to recover delinquent assessments against owners, including filing an action for damages um, and foreclosure of the association's assessment lien. Um, so, uh, Neil, during during COVID, I know that there's been um, you know some restrictions on, on on collections, and some folks haven't paid. Um, are, are you experiencing uh, significant delinquencies in, in, in your communities or has it been uh, fairly level? It's been fairly level, to be honest with you. Yeah, and it has been for us too. We're, we're kind of surprised by that. We thought there was going to be a huge influx in, in delinquencies or in collection matters. But generally speaking, I think everyone um, around the state uh, in connection with, with what's going on, people have worked with one another um, uh, given um, you know, some additional grace periods, um, things along those lines. So um, there hasn't been a huge influx of, of uh, lien foreclosure actions. Um, but when you get to this point, it's important to stay on top of them. Um, Neil, what do you tell your clients with, uh, with collections um, as far as turning them over to a, the, the attorney? At what time, at what amount of delinquency do you suggest? You know, one month, three months, six months? It's usually three months, 90 days. Yeah. And, and that, what, what that does is it gives the association the ability to send a friendly notice letter, you know, reminder letter. It gives the association the ability to then, um, after the friendly notice goes out, to say, hey, you haven't paid and you're going to hear from our attorney next. <clears throat> and then if they still haven't paid, then usually it comes to counsel's office. 
Um, and there's statutory procedure to collect assessments. The, the first step um, after those initial letters, um, and we can go to the next slide, would be sending a notice of intent to lien. Um, it has to go to the owner, advising them of the delinquency and requesting that the payment be moved to avoid the filing of a lien against their property. Um, there's a form letter um, required by 718 and 720. Go to the next slide. Hey, Aaron, real quick, when collecting assessments, um, who will typically send those out? Who addresses them? Would it be the CAM or would it be the board? It depends on your community. A lot of associations, they'll adopt a collection policy that says <clears throat> whenever an owner is um, this amount uh, of days delinquent, we want them to get a friendly notice letter, then we want them to get this kind of letter, and then we want them to go to the attorney. Um, it depends. It depends on the association. Most of the time, the board members don't want to, unless you're self-managed, the board members don't want to be bothered by that. And that's why you have a great management company like Vesta um, involved, is you can tell them, here are the trigger points. When it hits this time period, you guys send the letter. If, it, if we're still delinquent, we want it going to our attorney. And that way, um, as, as the board, you're not necessarily having to make decisions constantly on the collections process. Um, because if you wait 30 days, before you can even file a lien foreclosure action, if you're in a condo, <clears throat> it's gonna be another 60 days. If you're in an HOA, it's another 90 days, um, which means you could be six months plus delinquent before you can take uh, legal action by filing a lien foreclosure action against the owner. Um, and depending on the amount of your assessments, it can be really difficult for an owner to catch up. Um, next slide. So if you're in an HOA, the intent to lien letter, you need to send the letter and tell the owner they have 45 days to bring their account current, or you can record a claim of lien. In a condo, it's 30 days. You have to send the notice to the unit address and the last known address of the owner if it's different from the unit address. Um, if you're in an HOA, you also have to send it, which we do anyway, by matter of course, but if there's a third address, a different address on the property appraiser's website, then you send it to that address as well. Um, the notice has to be sent regular mail and certified mail return receipt requested. Next slide. Once the intent to lien uh, deadline has expired, the association can then record a claim of lien um, that secures the unpaid assessments and other amounts owed to the association, as well as assessments that have yet to come due. Um, to be valid, the claim of lien has to state the description of the parcel, the name of the owner, the name and address of the association, amount due and due dates. Um, it can be executed by an officer or agent of the association, such as property manager or the attorney. Um, preparation of the claim of lien is deemed to be the practice of law. So no one on their board should be filing their own claims of lien um, for very specific reasons, um, including the fact that if you mess up the legal description and you put unit one and it should be unit 11, you've slandered somebody else's title and you have exposure to damages. Um, but this is something that council should be completely handling on behalf of your community once you get to this stage. Next slide. Along with the claim of lien, you send an intent to foreclose letter saying <clears throat> a claim of lien has been prepared. And unless you bring your account current, a lawsuit's gonna be filed against you to foreclose the claim of lien. This is another statutory, uh, statutorily required letter. Next slide. Same notice requirement for this letter, 45 days uh, to bring the account current with an HOA, 30 days for a condo, um, have to send the notice in the same manner to the unit address or the last known address of the owner if it's different from the unit address and certified mail and return receipt requested. Uh, next slide. Um, collecting assessments from tenants. Neil, in your experience, how successful have have, have, it, have your clients been with sending these tenant rent demand letters? Uh, my <clears throat> prior management companies, they were pretty successful, but uh, with Vesta, we, we uh, used the attorneys to do it. And it yeah. is successful, yeah. Yeah, so this is something that if you have someone who is renting out their, their unit, they have a tenant in there, they are collecting rent every month and they're delinquent in their assessments. Well, that's just uh, completely unfair to everyone else within your community. Um, that people are receiving revenue and they're not paying their, uh, their association uh, dues. Um, 
which is allowing their tenant to enjoy the property and them to receive that revenue. So the statute provides a mechanism where if a unit is occupied by a tenant and the owner is delinquent, um, then the association can make a written demand on the tenant to pay the association the rental payments directly. And it's a specific form by the statute. Um, you don't wanna send a letter to the tenant telling the, uh, the, uh, the tenant that the owner is delinquent and he owes this much or she owes this much and uh, pay, pay the association directly. You wanna follow the exact language in the statute, tell them how to make payment. Um, and if they do that, and the landlord tries to evict them, the tenant has no liability um, to the landlord because the statute provides that specific level of protection to the tenant. Next slide. Neil, how many of your clients use finding procedures and, and like them? Um, I know in my personal portfolio, I've got uh, three of the seven that use them and they do like them. Yeah. And, um, Finding procedures that can work well, but you need to make sure it's handled properly. And this is a statute in 718 and 720 that it has been amended year after year after year to clear up confusion because a lot of associations um, would send out a violation letter and say, we've imposed a fine. You now have 14 days to request a hearing. And if you don't request a hearing, the fine is due. Um, Neil, do you have any of your clients that are doing that? Uh, we did in the past, but that's the incorrect way. Right. That's not the correct way um, anymore. And I'm happy to hear you say that you're doing that in the past um, because <clears throat> the statute specifically provides the board levies the fine, imposes the fine. And then the finding committee's sole job is to determine whether to confirm or reject the fine. Well, that's the finding committee's role to confirm or reject. The finding committee cannot, cannot make a decision without having a properly noticed finding committee meeting. And the fine is not due until it's been confirmed by the finding committee. So the proper procedure for fines is to send a notice to the owner telling them that the board is levied a fine and a finding committee hearing has been scheduled for this date, which is at least 14 days from the date of the, the notice letter. The finding committee then has to meet and it needs to be noticed like any other board meeting where it's open to the membership and um, needs to be noticed at least 48 hours in advance unless the documents have a longer time period. The finding committee will meet. The owner who's being fined, of course, received notice 14 days in advance. Um, and the finding committee decides to confirm or reject the fine. If they reject the fine, it's not owed. They confirm it, it's due within five days. That's the proper method of handling it. Um, and if you don't handle it in that way, you have not properly adopted a fine and you need to essentially uh, remove them from the, uh, the owner's ledgers. Um, next slide. Hey, Aaron, and just to clarify, um, if a fine cannot become a lien against a unit, a foreclosure cannot occur, correct? For a fine. In a condo, no, it cannot because condos do not permit fines to become a lien against a unit. In an HOA, it says that um, um, a, fine, a fines of less than $1,000 cannot be become a lien against a unit. It's our position that it says it cannot become a lien. It doesn't say it can or it does automatically. So if we have clients who want to HOAs, not condos, but if we have an HOA that wants to be able to lean for fines, it needs to be done and it's not clear in your documents that you can do it, then we recommend that they amend their documents to put in the individual or specific assessment section that say this includes um, <clears throat> uh, an individual assessment can be levied for any fine over $1,000. Um, doing that is the would be the best way to do it. If you don't have a finding committee, if you're in a five member condo or a five member association, um, you need to have, you're, you're kind of stuck because you can, you have to have a finding committee to impose fines. Um, the finding committee has to be completely independent of the board. 
So directors cannot be on the finding committee. It needs to be um, somebody who's not related to the board, lives with a board member, related to a board member. So that way it's separate and apart. Um, if you can't get those volunteers, you can't find. You can still take legal action against an owner that refuses to follow your, your use restrictions and your rules. If you're in an HOA, you can pursue the pre-suit mediation process and ultimately file an action in court against an owner. If you're in a condo, you can send a pre-arbitration demand letter and then file an arbitration action with the division of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of condominiums. But so there are other ways to enforce besides fining, but you have to have a fining committee, has to be independent, have to follow the proper procedures or you can't fine. Um, next slide. Okay, HOA elections is essentially the Wild West um, because the statute 720 says they're conducted in accordance with the governing documents. There's no specific procedure. So if you are in an HOA and you've been doing the two envelope um, uh, ballot, secret ballot system, just like condos do, and within your documents, it talks about a nominating procedure and nominations from the floor, you're doing it all wrong. You have to follow the procedure that's in your, your governing documents if you're in an HOA, period. You can amend it and change it, but you need to follow the procedure that's within your documents. All mel members are eligible and they may nominate themselves at the meeting. Um, if you have an HOA and there's an election process that permits nominations in advance of the meeting, you don't have to require nominations from the floor. Um, Permitting nominations in advance of the meeting may be needed, uh, may need to be in the governing documents um, and allow self-nomination, not just nominations through a committee where you have a board who puts a slate together and then those are the people who are, it's essentially a, a self-creating, um, the board just continues to elect themselves. When you have that kind of procedure after a period of time, it doesn't sit well with the members um, and you can amend the procedure and you don't have to go through the detailed process that condos do, but you can make it easier um, in connection with elections, um, especially with what we've seen this past year, because if you permit nominations from the floor at <coughs> a membership meeting and you're on Zoom, but you also require secret ballots, well, how are you going to permit nominations from the floor? Everyone's raising their hand to nominate themselves. And then how do you handle secret ballots? Um, it, it's complicated and you can amend your documents in an HOA to make elections easier and permit nominations in, in advance. Um, okay, and next slide. Eligibility, sorry, eligibility to serve as an HOA director. If you're delinquent in the payment of <clears throat> any fee, fine, or other monetary obligation that you could last nominate yourself, you're not eligible to sit on the board. That means if you have fines on your account, if you have some delinquent assessments, you're not eligible to serve on the board. And if you become more than 90 days delinquent in the payment of any fee or fine, you're deemed to have abandoned your seat. Um, if you've been convicted of a felony, um, you may not seek election to the board unless you've had your civil rights restored for at least five years. Um, now this doesn't mean you have to go and do a background check on every board member um, before they're, they, they uh, they uh, take their position because the validity of any action by the board is not affected if it's later determined that a person was not eligible to, to run for the board. Uh, next slide, please. Condo association elections. This is where it's really, really important to have great management in place um, because it's very detailed. The procedure you need to follow is detailed. And if you miss deadlines, then you have to start start uh, the procedure either all over or from a certain uh, uh, point in time. Um, so unless the bylaws provide otherwise, board members' terms expire at the annual meeting. You may serve in a condo, you may serve no more than eight consecutive years unless approved by two thirds of all votes cast in the election. Um, there are some recent statutory changes that, that provided for that. Um, so if you want to be on your condo board, you've certainly, this is, would be your ninth year. You can put in your, your, your name in the hat. And if you get two thirds of all people cast votes that voted for you, great. You're on the board. 
the term limit is, is not going to apply to you. But um, there is a, an eight consecutive year limit. Next slide. If the number of board members whose terms expire at the annual meeting equals or exceeds the number of candidates, they become members effective upon the adjournment of the meeting. Essentially, if you have five board positions and you only get three interested parties to run, then those three people automatically become board members. You don't need to conduct an election. And the second paragraph here says, unless your bylaws provide otherwise, those three people that were just seated on the board can now appoint the other two board members to make up the, uh, the, the rest of the board position. Okay, next slide. For an election in a condo, uh, the association members must receive two notices um, via mail, um, hand delivery or electronically to the unit owners that have agreed to um, receive notice in such manner. Now, for the election notice, where you have to send in ballot, a two ballot system, unless you're doing electronic voting, um, those have to go uh, by mail in person. Okay, uh, next next slide. The first notice of, of the election. Um, the first notice of the election must be mailed, emailed, or hand delivered at least 60 days prior to the annual meeting. It can be part of any other uh, unit owner communication such as a routine newsletter. Next slide. And there's no specific format by statute, um, but the notice should include the date, time, and location of the annual meeting information on how a unit owner becomes a candidate and details for the candidate information sheet um, that an owner is permitted to submit. If you don't properly issue the first notice at least 60 days in advance, you have to start from scratch all the way from the beginning. Next slide. So 60 days, you have to send out the notice. At least 40 days prior to the annual meeting, anyone it gives them 20 days to get these back, Anyone who wants to run for the board must provide um, an intent to run form signed, completed by the uh, candidate um, uh, back to the board. You may send a letter. It could be an email. It could be a fax. You could hand deliver a written statement um, to the association of your intent to run. The association must issue a written notice of receipt of the intent to run and may deliver the receipt by mail, email, fax, or hand delivery. It is the owner's job to make sure that the intent to run form is timely received by that 40 days. If the owner puts it in the mail at 41 days before and it's not received by the association and they don't get a receipt on that 40th day, they're not a candidate. So it's the owner's obligation to make sure that they are receiving a written receipt, not the associations. Okay, next slide. Board member eligibility. Any unit owner um, or other eligible person, depending on your docs, uh, <clears throat> may be a candidate for board membership. They have to give their written notice at least 40 days in advance and must be eligible to serve on the board um, at, the time, at the time of the deadline. Um, next slide. So you're not eligible for the board if you've been suspended or removed from the division under Chapter 718. You're delinquent in the payment of any fee or fine or assessment owed to the association. You're a convicted felon who hasn't had your civil rights completely restored for more than five years. And this is important and this question gets asked a lot for smaller associations. Um, but in association of more than 10 units, co-owners may not serve on the board at the same time unless they own more than one unit or there are not enough eligible candidates to fill all the vacancies. Um, if you're in an association with fewer than 10, then it's okay. Next slide. Real quick, Aaron. Um, yeah. If a board member has been on the board for years before the change in statute, does the time frame that you mentioned apply it, to them? There's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, dispute uh, in connection with that. Um, and the division has given uh, some written opinions on that. It depends on what we're talking about. Was it five years before? Do you start counting from 
the, uh, the, the date the statute was enacted and then it's eight years. Um, a lot of associations take the position that the statute operates prospectively, not retroactively. So they're not going to look at terms before that time period. Um, but some associations uh, take the position that we wanna be conservative. And if we have served more than eight years or it's the, the statute was enacted while you're on the board prohibiting the consecutive service for eight years or more, then um, they would um, serve, finish serving their term. And then for the next election, they would need the two thirds of, of, of owners. It depends on um, that particular person and how many years they had served uh, prior and kind of where they are in the election process. Um, and, um, and, and I know that there's another question about it. Anyone who's running for the board has, if you're a current board member and you want to serve, you want to re have a, you want to be eligible for re-election. Any person who wants to be on the board, if your term is expiring, you have to do the intent to run 40 days in advance. If you don't, you are not a candidate in this election. Um, so you need to make sure it goes into the association that you intend to run, or you're not going to qualify as a candidate. Period. Um, so candidate information. So now you've sent in your intent to run form. You have an additional five days <coughs> to get to the association a, um, a uh, candidate information sheet. Um, it's one-sided, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Some people um, use it um, the way it should be used as a resume, talking about all the things they like about the community, what they want to do better, how they want to, you know, all the, the difference they can make. Some people use it to bash existing board members and, uh, you know, turn it into a, a battle. Um, you need to be careful um, because candidate information sheets become part of the association's official records, number one. Number two, the association cannot censor them. So if you put something horrible on there, it's going out to all the, the membership. And if it's defamatory, you as an individual are potentially liable for such defamatory content. So just be careful with what you're going to be putting on these things and, and, and sending out. Um, next slide. So second notice of election. Um, it must be mailed or hand delivered. Um, electronic transmission is not an option. Um, where you're going to be, unless you're electronically voting, um, but between 14 and 34 days prior to the annual meeting. <clears throat> There's no specific format required for the notice, <clears throat> but I always recommend that you include instructions to folks. This is how you cast a vote, because as we'll talk about in a moment, it's very specific. Information on how to fill out and submit the annual meeting proxy that's going to go out with the meeting notice. Um, and then detail on any other specific items, whether you're going to have a surplus carryover, uh, year, the financial reporting, um, redu reduction of reserves, um, amendments, wh whatever the case may be. Next slide. Along with the second notice, you should include an agenda for your annual meeting, a limited proxy for quorum purposes, a ballot that includes only the names of the candidates listed alphabetically by surname and only the people who submitted their name 40 days plus in advance, um, the candidate information receipts received by the board and an outer envelope labeled with the address of the property manager or association and spacious for, for the owner's unit number, name and signature, an inner envelope with nothing on the outside. Unit owners that own more than one unit, they, they should have an inner envelope for each unit they own. If you fail to properly issue this second notice, you have to restart the notification process from the second notice again. You don't go back to 60 day notice. You go back to the second notice of the election. Next slide. The ballots um, have to list all eligible candidates in alphabetical order by last name. You can't put stars by people who are incumbents. You can't contain any writing candidates because no nominations are permitted from the floor or, or on the ballot themselves. Um, you cannot have a space for the voter signature on the ballot itself. And then must be uniform in color and appearance. Next slide. Voting envelopes. 
Um, the two envelopes. I know we already talked about this, but this is important. The outer envelope has to be pre-addressed to the person or entity authorized to receive ballots. It has to contain the place for the name of the eligible voter, the unit identification, and the space for the voter's signature, and then one inner envelope. Next slide. I know this procedure seems nitpicky, um, uh, but this is exactly what it calls for in the um, in uh, the Florida Administrative Code. And if you don't follow it properly, and there's a contest of the election, then you could potentially have to go through the process all over again. Uh, Neil, what's the latest that you were uh, at a meeting counting counting these envelopes? Um. Yeah, I've uh, I've got an association that's 912 units, and it took us <clears throat> with about six counters. It took us about um, two hours, two and a half hours to get through them all. Yeah, I think the latest that that one of these went um, from one of my clients uh, was 1130 at night. Started you know five in the afternoon because they wanted to count and then recount. Um, but I've heard stories where they they went all night because people wanted to recount. Um, so um, you just make sure you follow the proper procedure so you're, you're not counting, recounting, and having to do it twice. Um, but for the voting procedure, the owner has to place their marked ballot, not their signed ballot, <clears throat> in the inner envelope. The owners of multiple units can then place more than one inner envelope in the outer envelope. You have to identify the unit or units on the outer envelope. If you have two units, you need to identify both units on the outer envelope. Or when the, the, um, the envelopes are open, the outer envelope is open and there's, there's two inner envelopes, they'll be disregarded. Um, so you must submit the envelope to the association containing the ballot before the annual meeting. You can also call for them at the, at the meeting itself. Okay, next slide. Once a ballot gets sent in, it cannot be rescinded or changed after it's been received. Ballots cannot be opened until the meeting. Um, ballots are not necessary to fill any vacancy unless like we talked about, there are two or more eligible candidates. Next slide. During the annual meeting, the election must take place at the same time and place as the annual meeting. The first order of business is to collect the ballots not yet, yet cast, you call for them. There's no quorum requirement for the election but at least 20% of the voters must vote for the election to be valid. Now this is for condos. So if you have 15% of the owners that submit a ballot, you don't have an election. The existing board rolls over for another year, unless you want to continue the meeting to another date and time and permit more ballots to come in. Um, there's, there's no different quorum requirement for HOAs though, in connection with elections. I just wanna point that out. The 20% does not apply to HOAs. Next slide, counting votes. Counting has to happen at the annual meeting in a location that's visible to all attendees. Once all ballots have been collected, the names and unit numbers listed on the outer envelopes are then going to be checked against a list of eligible voting <clears throat> by an impartial committee. You know, board members, candidates, or family members of board members. When the voter's name is found on the list, the voter's name is checked off as having voted. Next slide. In this process, any outer envelopes without a signature are marked with the word disregarded and they're put to the side. They're not included in the vote count. They're not thrown away, they're just put to the side. Any honor, outer envelope signed by someone other than those on the list of eligible voters is marked disregarded and not put in the vote count. Once you've gone through all the outer envelopes, make sure um, then what you do is all inner envelopes are removed from the outer envelopes and placed in a separate box. The, the inner envelopes are then going to be opened. But any inner envelopes, so the inner envelopes are then going to start to be opened. Any inner envelopes that have more than one ballot inside, once you start to open them, are marked as disregarded and not included in the vote count. While you're doing this, we highly recommend you continue with all the other business of your meeting because this can take some time. Next slide. The impartial committee counts the votes, candidates with the most votes wins. You announce the results during the meeting, 
Um, if there's a tie, you conduct a runoff election. Uh, Neil, how many runoff elections have you handled? I just won in seven years. Yeah, they're, they're not very common, uh, but let's go to the next slide. If there's a runoff election, it doesn't happen that night. We don't see, uh, we, we don't see anything happen that night. Um, what has to happen is within seven days after the annual meeting or election, a notice of runoff election has to be sent with a new ballot and the candidate information sheets, the two envelopes all over again, but only for those two people. Um, and the runoff election has to be held within 21 to 30 days after the uh, annual meeting election. If you have anyone that needs assistance by reason of blindness, disability, or inability to read or write, they can uh, request um, for they can request assistance um, of a member or the board of administration or unit owner uh, uh, casting the individual's vote. Uh, vote. Okay. Board member certification. Before we move on to this, I know there's a question regarding allowing people to attend in person, but live person attendance versus um, uh, Zoom attendance because of COVID. We've been in a, I'm not gonna go into this in any amount of detail. We've, we've uh, addressed these questions. I'm sure you've addressed these questions uh, with property management and, and council over the past year. Um, the board needs to act reasonably. Um, as we all know, there are limitations on how many people can attend a meeting in person um, or attend in person in a closed in area. Those are changing constantly. Um, I suggest you reach out to council to discuss um, <clears throat> those, those situations or property manager in connection with, with meetings, um, the, uh, in connection with membership meetings. Um, chapter 607 has language that permits uh, membership meetings to be conducted electronically so long as people have the means to participate um, meaningfully like they would if they were there in person. Um, I know some people may say that um, it, it, they have difficulty logging on to the computer or, um, or they don't have a computer. Um, however, people all have, when you're doing Zoom, there's always a number of people can call in and actually call into a meeting. Um, and, and participate uh, by calling in and listening to everything. But board member, boards need to act reasonably. If you have adopted a policy that until restrictions are lifted due to COVID, that you are going to, um, because of your space is small, that you're going to limit attendance to the first X number of people to show up and it's fairly implemented, um, then um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find um, a, uh, a court or arbitrator that is going to take issue with the association acting reasonably and cautiously and connecting a connection with that, especially because um, I haven't attended a hearing in court in a year. All the judges are attending hearings electronically. Um, and that is how things are being done now. So just act reasonably in connection with how you handle it. Work closely with uh, management and, 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 and counsel. Um, to avoid, you know, potential problems as, as things move forward. But hopefully it'll be a non-issue in the near future. That, that's what we're all hoping for, right? Um, okay, board member certification. Within 90 days, this is what you're doing today, after being elected to the board, you either have to certify in writing that you have read and you understand all the governing documents and you're going to faithfully discharge your, your duties. In lieu of that certification, a newly elected or appointed board member may submit a certificate of satisfactory completion, um, such as the one that you're gonna be receiving from, uh, from VESTA after this. Um, and you need to put your name on it and provide it back to your property management company. Um, you Once you've completed this course, you won't have to uh, uh, take a course like this again or do another certification as long as you continuously serve on the board. Next slide. Suspension of voting rights. And this is what we touched on briefly a while ago. Um, the board um, failure to, for well, first, board member certification. If you do not do the board certification or submit your um, information timely, then the board, uh, you're, you're, you're suspended from the board essentially, and the board can temporarily fill the vacancy during that period of suspension. Um, 
a vacancy created based um, on a director being suspended. Um, only the suspension only lasts until they've fulfilled their certification requirements. Next slide. So suspension of voting rights. This is what we were talking about before. If you're more than 90 days delinquent, you may suspend a unit owner's voting rights. You have to give at least 48 hours notice of the meeting before the board, um, just like you would for any other board meeting. And you must notify the unit owner by mail or hand delivery. <clears throat> the suspension ends as soon as they make their payment. But the impact is on the next slide. And this was particularly helpful when you were dealing with all these mortgage foreclosure actions where the lenders were taking title or the owners were gone um, and they didn't care to participate. You want to amend your documents and you have a 25% delinquency? Well, make it easier to amend your documents by cutting out all those folks that are delinquent and aren't responding to anything from the association anyway. Next slide. <clears throat> Official records. Neil, does this what uh, uh, your, your satellite storage facilities look like because of the official records inspection obligations? Uh, no, we've actually relocated everything to the Brandon office. But it does look <laughs> like that, yes. All right, next slide. So associations are required to maintain their official records within the state for at least seven years. And some records must be maintained indefinitely, like the governing documents, like meeting minutes, et cetera. Um, you have to make them available to a unit owner within 45 miles of the association property or within the county in which the property is located. Next slide. So what's included? Um, a lot of things, more things than, uh, than we'll even like run through. All the things and within this, um, this slide you'll see in the next few slides, it's plans, permits, warranties, and this is for condo and HOA. Um, rosters of owners, minutes of association board and unit owner meetings, insurance policies. Next slide. Um, their management agreement, um, bills of sale or transfer for property owned by the association if you're a condo, contracts for work to be performed, including bids. Um, Next slide. Accounting records for at least seven years. Itemized receipts of all um, um, for at least seven years, including but limited to records of receipts and expenditures, statement of account for each unit owner, including the unit owner's name, due date and amount of each assessment, audits, reviews, accounting statements, and financial reports of the association. Next slide. Ballots, sign-in sheets, voting proxies, all of the papers related to voting have to be kept for one year from the date of the election if you're in a condo. Rental records if you're acting as a rental agent, the FAQ sheet in condos and HOAs, and the big catch-all provision is other documents related to the operation of the association. So next slide. So the statutes have you maintain, you're required to maintain all other records um, pertaining to the operation of the association. This can include correspondence between the board and members, emails concerning association business. So you need to be careful in what you put in emails because certain emails, depending on who's copied on them, how emails are exchanged could, and I use the word could because there's a detailed analysis you, you would go through, um, before, before um, those records would be considered official records, but whether those are considered the official records of the association subject to um, production or inspection rather, not production. Next slide. If you're in a condominium, you also have the inspection report that's been prepared um, that con in, contains all the detailed information. Uh, next slide. The association is obligated by law to provide access to records within 10 business days after receipt by the board or its representative of a written request. Now, if you go to the next slide, you can comply with the request by having a copy of them available for inspection or copying in the community um, or make them uh, make the records available to a parcel owner electronically or by allowing the records to be viewed in an electronic format on a computer screen and printed upon request. 
Now, um, what I highly recommend for all my clients is they adopt rules regarding official records, inspection and requests. So if you have an owner who sends you an email at three in the morning, that can be measured in feet, not paragraphs. And within there are, I, I wanna see the minutes from this meeting and you don't make them available in 10 days, technically you fail to comply. So I always recommend that you adopt official records inspection rules that would say, you have to send a certified mail return receipt requested to the registered agent. So that way the association is better suited to answer those specific requests to inspect official records. Next slide. Unit owners have the right to make or obtain copies of the records. Um, like I said, you can adopt reasonable rules regarding the inspection. You have to have an adequate number of copies of the declaration, articles, bylaws, rules, and all amendments um, available for, for members. Next slide. But copy expenses are chargeable to the unit owners in certain situations. In condominiums, the right to inspect includes the right to make or obtain copies at the reasonable expense of the member. So if somebody contacts you, you, uh, your condo association and say they want all financial records, you don't have to provide them to them. You need to make them available for inspection. Uh, if they say, I want to get copies of everything, then they can get a pretty hefty bill for the cost per page that would take the association to provide copies. In an, in an HOA, if they have a copy machine available, you have to provide them with copies um, if the request is no more than 25 pages. Beyond that, then the reasonable expense of copying. And if you have to have personnel retrieve and copy the records, you can actually charge them for personnel costs as well. Next, uh, next slide. <clears throat> Electronic copies of documents. Um, and this, the only reason this is in here is because the statute actually says this, which means that people have thought about it, but you can allow somebody to use their own portable device, such as a smartphone, tablet, scanner, to make an electronic copy of the records in lieu of the association providing a copy. And yes, this is in the statute as well. The association cannot charge somebody for using their own device to make those, um, to make those uh, copies. Next slide. If you fail to provide the records within 10 working days after receipt of the request, the unit owner may be entitled to damages. Um, the statute says it is $10, it's $50 a day, up to 10 days, plus attorney's fees, plus any actual damages. Um, actual damages are rare, but there have been situations where, where they've been imposed. Um, next slide. That doesn't mean all records are available. If you have records prepared by or the direction of the attorney, um, those may not be available. Um, if you're if you uh, approve rentals um, or sales, the documents you receive in connection with the approval are not subject to inspection. Personnel records and this whole list of records here, payroll um, records, um, are, are not subject to inspection. Next slide. Medical records of unit owners, such as if you approve um, uh, reasonable accommodation requests under the Fair Housing Act for the assistance animals, those medical records are not open to the unit owners. Personally identifying information, um, not open to the unit owners. Of course, passwords and things along those lines are not open to the unit owners. Um, and with that, that completes all of the content that I have. I know we have a few questions um, that are still um, sitting there, um, and I'll, I'll go through them, um, up here. Let's see. So the, there's a question about construction of a storage shed, whether that qualifies as a material alteration. It depends on whether you're in an HOA or a condo, and it depends on the language within your governing documents. If you're in a condo, yes, it would be considered a material alteration unless there is an exclusion for that within your, your, your documents. If you're in an HOA, it solely depends on your documents. Um, if you are, if there's material alterations that the association is moving forward on and you don't like them, um, you can uh, consult with uh, your own counsel and, and consider 
what legal action you, you want to take based on whether it's an HOA or a condo. Um, there's a question about um, if a resident borders on incompetence and neighbors are fearful because of issues with, with the resident that the resident could cause, that that's an answer that you need to bring it up to your property manager um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, they can consult with counsel to discuss um, how to proceed in the best manner possible. Um, and as far as uh, the slides, um, I know that Vesta already has a copy of the slides and those slides can be provided to, to anyone who, who's, who's interested. Um, Neil, do you have any other, are there any other comments or items in the chat that's come through? Um, Leslie, uh, anything else? No, I was able to answer a few as we were going through the uh, presentation. We do have one more here, Aaron. May a condo owner request copies of vendor contracts? Vendor contracts are part of the official records. So if you do an official records inspection request, then yes, you can review vendor contracts. Absolutely. And we have one more. Can you briefly discuss limited common elements? Yep. So if you're in a condo, um, I'll give you an example. The, the easy one is, you know, a balcony. If you're in a condo, you look in your declaration and it will say uh, a limited common element is something that is subject to the exclusive use of one unit. It's a common element, it's outside the boundaries of the unit, but it is um, subject to the exclusive use of a particular owner. As far as who's responsible for maintaining the common element, it depends on your documents. Some of them make the association responsible, some of them make the owners responsible, it really just depends. Um, but things that would be a limited common element would be storage facilities, parking spaces, depending on your documents, um, uh, balconies, terraces, things along those lines. Um, and this is for condo. If you're in an HOA, uh, a limited common element doesn't apply. That language is not used in chapter 720. And I wanna just, cause I think we handle all the questions. I just wanna thank everyone for, for your, um, for your, your, your attention. I'll assume that no one else is doing anything during this board certification course. Um, and uh, if you have any additional questions, you can of course reach out to Vesta. They know how to, uh, to get in touch with me. Um, and I wanna thank Vesta for putting this together. Uh, Leslie, Neil, and the entire team at Vesta. Um, thank you for, uh, for hosting. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I really appreciate you partnering with us for these webinars. Uh, we're getting a lot of really good comments. I think we have one more question if you have time. Sure. Uh, record requests, can a resident of an HOA uh, emails, can they get email and therefore have email to communicate? Many residents would not, I'm not really sure what this is saying, would not. I, I, I will tell you in connection with records and inspection, <laughs> With, re with email records, because that's a hot button topic. Um, there have been some arbitration cases that have interpreted this as saying that if you have, um, if you have an association owned device, you have a computer in the management office um, and the manager, that's what the manager works from or that's what the board members work from, then emails exchanged from that association owned device may, I use the word may, be considered official records. Um, if you have board members sending emails from their own email address to other board members, those are not official records. But if you have property managers being copied on those emails, then those may be considered official records. And that's why you need to be careful what you put in emails. Um, because if you don't want it, uh, big and blown up on a screen or, or on a board in, in court or arbitration. You want to be careful in what you say and temper what you say. And um, some of my associations choose not to include property management on certain, um, on certain communications for that very reason. Perfect. Well, I think that is all. And again, uh, thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, Neil. Uh, we really appreciate um, again, you partnering with FESTA for these informative webinars. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.